Welcome back, everyone. Joining me now, an old friend of mine. Um, I'm old. He's not. Um, John Fund, uh, who is the co-author, along with Hans von Spakovsky, of Our Broken Elections, How the Left Changed the Way You Vote. John, welcome to the uh, newly revamped Ed Morrissey Show. Welcome back, I should say. Well, welcome to Ed Morrissey striding across Texas <laughs> like, like the... Uh, like the tough hombre blogger he is. Well, I, I tell you, I'm enjoying myself down here in Texas. Uh, it, it, it feels like freedom down here. And uh, there's lots of reasons to be in Texas. They're all good. And um, I, I, I know that, uh, I know that you've, uh, you, you have, uh, as you're secretly a Texan in your heart, right, John? Uh, the, the, the spirit of liberty breathes freely in Texas, and I'm with them. Well, there you go. John Fund, of course, again. Um, the and I have author. relatives in Dallas as well. Oh, well, there so, you go. So, yeah, you're you're Texas um, by extension. You're Texan by extension. Exactly. So, there you go. All right. So, um, so we're going to talk a little bit about Broken Elections. That's the title of John's book. Came out in November. Uh, Co-authored uh, with Hans von Spankowski, Our Broken Elections. I know both of you guys write a tremendous amount on elections, election law, election policy, both of you have been doing this for years and years and years, so you guys are truly experts in this field. Uh, what led you to, to put this in book form, and why do it now? Ed, the 2020 election um, marked a real breaking point for a lot of people. Uh, after the election and after you know the horrible events of January 6th, we had a completely polarized country, and a year later, we still do. Think about this. Uh, a third of Americans believe that Hillary Clinton won the 2016 election, not Donald Trump. You know, they blame Russia Gate. They blame right. uh, excessive media coverage of the uh, emails. They blame Jim Comey of the FBI, um, whatever. A third of Americans believe Donald Trump won the 2020 election, not Joe Biden. So you have two thirds of Americans who believe that the winner of one of the last two elections wasn't legitimate. That is bad for our democracy, our republic. And I think that it's corrosive. Uh, the Supreme Court has said that if people lose confidence in the legitimacy of elections, voter turnout will go down and um, the, the country will be more polarized than ever. So I wanted to do a book that did one thing that I think will be valuable. There are a lot of people on the left who have literally given up saying that there's any voter fraud. They used to claim, well, a mail-in balloting, you can have voter fraud, we should have protections that, but people don't show up at the polls and pretend to be someone they're not. But they've abandoned that. Now the left wing's position is there is no voter fraud. It doesn't happen, it's a unicorn. There are people, and some of them are our allies, who believe the strangest things about the 2020 election, you know, computer hacking from China, uh, thermostats were, were set that would uh, alter the elections right. from behind the screen. Uh, you know, let's put it this way. Not everything you read on the internet is necessarily true. I know that will shock you. I'm stunned. I, uh, John, yeah. I'm totally stunned by this. Uh, except the and, stuff that you and I write on the internet. Yeah. It's totally and, and Yes. And, and you know, some lawyers purporting to work for Donald Trump, like Sidney Powell and Lynn Wood and John Eastman, just went off the rails and said things that just weren't so. And as we know, Donald Trump will is prone to exaggerating certain things. Occasionally. So I believe that they needed to be a book that was completely and thoroughly documented that said there were real problems, real issues with the 2020 election. And not just fraud, but chaos, disorganization. I mean, one of the lines in our book is, the problem with our sloppy election systems is you can't tell where the incompetence ends and the fraud begins. Right. And... I really believe that the value of this book is you can take it to any friend, uh, independent voter, Democratic voter, and say, read this. It is, has 45 pages of footnotes. We have a problem with our elections. And regardless of who you think actually won the 2020 election, we need to fix these problems because we're going to have a close election again soon enough. You know, I, and I think that that's something that we have seen, you know, over and over again here. I mean, 
you know I'm, uh, you know, I, I was living in Minnesota for the last 24 years or so prior to. You've seen this problem up close. <laughs> really Al up Franken, close. phone your office. Well, and, and here's the thing is that the stuff that I ended up doing this, this is a really long story. I'm not going to get into the whole thing. I started doing a, uh, an investigative report on the recount. It wasn't about the election. It was about the recount. And it started, you know, after election day. This and is the Franken race. This is the Franken race in 2000. Al Franken versus Norm Coleman. He ended up supposedly winning by 317 votes. After after first be, being behind by 200 and, right. and, and, and change. Right. Um, and what I discovered in this, a couple things that I discovered in this, is that first off, Norm Coleman, you know Norm, right? Norm's, yes. Norm's a great guy. Norm is... But boy, I mean, boy, did he hire bad lawyers. He, Well... It, there's background to this, though, because two years earlier, there had been a recount in a, in a house race in Minnesota five, no, Minnesota 6, excuse me. Uh, Doug Kennedy was the incumbent, right. and I forget who he was running against. But, you know, the recount, there was one of those, let's sit around the camp, it was a real Minnesota sort of thing, right? Let's sit around the campfire, let's just go through these things again and see how it turns out sort of thing. And both sides treated it as a collegial effort to just find out you know what the you know what the what the outcome was supposed to be two years later though al franken brings in you know these shark attorneys who are going to turn this Elias. Thing, yeah mark elias being one of them who gets a big prominent mention in, in your book our broken elections how the left changed the way you vote and uh these guys turn it into a pitched battle now i'm not saying it's illegal they were they were operating within the law but it was a whole different paradigm and it took norm coleman's campaign and and lawyers maybe two or three days to catch up to this and that was all <laughs> by that time the battle was lost and i talked to people who were doing the recounts on both sides um and they all said the same thing is that you know norm coleman came in there to to be uh a good guy, not that guy, was the quote. We don't want to be that guy. Um, and Al Franklin was very comfortable with coming in and being that guy and getting you know ballots tossed out uh, on the basis of just extraneous nonsense. And that's how they ended up fighting and winning this thing. So I wrote this big well, they piece. Were, you're absolutely right, but there were two other factors. Uh, the first factor was they were very careful in um, the recounting of the, especially the absentee ballots, yep. which as you know, have to be signature verified and you know people have to make sure that the postmark is there and all that. <laughs> they were very careful to demand different standards from counties run by Democratic clerks, especially Minneapolis, St. Paul, and counties run by Republican clerks. The Republican clerks tended to follow the letter of the law. The Democratic clerks tended to be subject to pressure from Elias's lawyers. And because a lot of the people could be categorized as minority voters, they bent the rules. They basically let a lot of ballots in that wouldn't otherwise have met the strict standard. Right. So if you do that enough, you're going to change votes. And in this case, all you had to do was change a few hundred. Secondly, as you know, Minnesota Majority, which was a public interest group in the state, did an after the after all the bodies were buried and after Franken was sworn in, they looked at the felon voters in the state. And these are people who had been served their time but hadn't gotten their civil rights restored so they were ineligible to vote. They found there were 1,200 felon voters who had voted in the Senate election. Yep. And Fox News affiliate in Minneapolis went and did a survey of them, 90% voted for Franken. So if you take 90% of 1,200, that gives you 1,080. Uh, votes that Franken got that he shouldn't have gotten, and he won by 317. You do the math, that pretty much proves Al Franken did not win that election. Yeah, I mean, and, and believe me, I mean, I, I, I think Norm Coleman won that election. He lost the recount, and that's what the problem was. And well, Mark Elias's view of recounts is very simple. The rule of the recount under Mark Elias is you count, you count, you count until your guy is ahead, and then you stop counting. Right. Yeah, famously, I mean, he's he doesn't hide that a bit. Uh, but but the the point of bringing this up is is sort of to underscore your point here in our broken elections and and the necessity of fixing these things is that most of this stuff happens. Most of the stuff that you're talking about here happens in elections all the time. Not the recount so much, but the but the other stuff. The the, re, the reason why we don't hear more about this is because most of the time the gaps on elections are so wide that it doesn't really 
matter. Those things are nibbling at the edges. They don't change the outcomes. In Minnesota in 2008, they changed the outcome. And, well, and as that's you the know, problem. It really changed the outcome because it changed history. As you know, um, at the beginning of the year, after this is the year of Obama's victory, so they brought in some new Democratic senators. Yep. The beginning of the year, the Senate was 59 Democrats, 40 Repub 40, 39 Republicans, uh, 40 Rep 39 Republicans, and one vacancy, uh, which would have been Al Franken's seat, because the seat was vacant for six months while they argued about the recount. Right. Well, Ed, they, they passed Obamacare only after Franken was seated and gave them 60 votes, which gave them the filibuster-proof Senate, which meant Republicans couldn't stop debate. That meant we got Obamacare because of the Al Franken right. suspect victory. And if he if they hadn't gotten Obamacare, they would have had to have a much lower standard of uh, government intervention and in health care. History would be different. We wouldn't be talking about nearly the size of deficits and the problems people are having getting doctor's appointments in some cases that we are now. That's exactly correct. And that's the reason why they matter. It's the reason why elections matter and why you need to make sure you get them right. And again, going back to our broken elections, how the left changed the way you vote, I... I, I I, I take your point very seriously here, which is that uh, even though a lot of the nonsense theories about the 2016 and the 2020 election were are just that, they're nonsense, there's still a lot of problems that need to be fixed that can be fixed. And the very first thing that you can do for, for election security is the first thing that Democrats want to get rid of in you know SB1, HR1, which is voter ID, which is a very, very popular... <laughs> security uh step it's well it's, it's especially popular with a lot of health bureaucrats who say that you have to show an id to get in to a restaurant to get into you know anything now we need photo id ed to go and do almost anything in this country from applying for medicare to um traveling to uh getting any kind of a check cashed just just um, to get your prescriptions I, i'll i'll tell you this you can use this sure. maybe as an anecdote i went to go pick up a prescription for my wife it's uh it's a uh, you know it's a uh, controlled one of those schedule controlled things that she that she has as a prescription they require me now to produce my identification and they actually scan it when i pick it up because of course they're concerned about people uh, buying these things and trafficking in them. But I mean, I couldn't even get that prescription without not just showing my ID, but having it scanned into the computers at the pharmacist. So yeah, I mean, we we, we do this all the time. Well, you know, I uh, have been frustrated by the liberal opposition to voter ID for a long time um, because, you know, they use every kind of excuse. They claim that, you know, 25% of African-Americans lack a proper government ID. That is so patronizing and preposterous it's not even worth discussing yep. uh, and then they then they argue that well you know okay maybe you need to show an id to enter a federal building but that's not a constitutional right uh voting is a constitutional right and i say excuse me there are 50 states to get married in all 50 states whether it's a gay wedding a straight wedding or whatever it is you have to show a photo id to, vote, to ma get married that's a constitutional right Right. You just said it was. You had a Supreme Court case on that. Well, if it's a if you require a photo ID for that, you require a photo ID for voting, and it makes perfect sense. You know, Andy Young, Jimmy Carter, and Martin Luther King the Third, um, and Bill Clinton all endorsed something called the Freedom Card a few years ago because they were trying to break the stalemate uh, over voter ID, and they said, look. You know, we're not going to get involved as to who, you know, which state has a good voter ID law or which state has a restrictive voter ID law. But let's just agree on this. Let's take Social Security cards that everyone is eligible for and has a number. Let's put a photo on it. That would be 10 cents. And let's use that as a backstop, a final, you know, photo ID that people can use to vote. Sure. And it made perfect sense. They got conservative endorsement. I endorsed it. Uh, my co-author endorsed it. And they took the idea um, through a guy who used to be Pat Leahy's uh, policy director. He was the senator who was the chairman of the Judiciary Committee. They took the idea to the Obama White House, Ed, and they gave it to them. And Obama said, well, you know, Eric Holder will make that call for me. You go through the Justice Department. So they went to see Eric Holder and he said, well, I got to clear it with my people here and my outside policy advisors. 
So finally, they heard nothing. After months, they finally got an answer. We're not going to go forward with the idea because our official liaison to the African-American community, Al Sharp, doesn't like the idea. <laughs> well, it's good that they were in charge. <laughs> well, Al Sharpton, you know, runs a political machine in New York. Yeah. And, you know, Al Sharpton is, you know, the epitome of the con artists, you know, scammer. And of course, voter fraud is something that I'm sure he's not a stranger to. No, probably not. Um, I but here's my point. Oh, yeah, go here's, ahead. Here's my point. So we handed the left a compromise on this issue that had Bill Clinton, Jimmy Carter, um, Martin Luther King III, Andrew Young's support. They all agreed that this should be called the Freedom Card because it would help a lot. If anybody didn't have a photo ID, they would be helped by this. You know, let's stop arguing in court and spending hundreds of millions of dollars on whether or not there should be voter ID. Let's get people a voter ID. They wouldn't take that. So, Ed, you have to ask the question, if they won't take such a reasonable compromise that actually solves the problem that they purport exists, what in the world are they opposing voter ID for? Right. I think it's because something goes on behind the curtain that they know about and they don't want the rest of us to know about and they want it to keep going. Uh, a couple other points from the book. I don't want to. I don't want to reveal all the all the aspects of the book because I want people to go out and buy the book. Our broken elections. Um, how the left changed the way you vote by John Fund and uh, co-authored by Hans von Spankowski. Um, but uh, uh, two things come up in the book that I want to just touch on at least briefly. One is absentee ballots. Now I use absentee ballots because it's a little easier for me to do absentee than going to the polling place. Sometimes I'm traveling on election day, for instance. Well, in um, Texas, they have a very strong early voting system, yep. which means you can go to a local government office, you know, 10 days before the election or so and vote there. Uh, many people find that just as convenient. And remember, if you use a mail-in ballot, you're giving up your secret ballot. Right, right. Um, so I was doing this in Minnesota, of course, but uh, next year in Texas, I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to structure my structure my voting day but uh check but, out early voting but uh, I, I will definitely check out early voting but absentee ballot fraud I, I think this is a really interesting area we've seen some of this and not just absentee ballot it's the, the absentee ballots itself but ballot harvesting that kind of comes from the absentee ballot process that is you talk about this as being the tool of choice for vote thieves we've actually seen this happen there was a house race um i want to say in 2018 that yes. had to be re had to be redone because of a ballot harvesting scandal. Yes, there was a political consultant in North Carolina who normally vote, worked for Democratic candidates, but in 2018 the Republican congressional candidate near Charlotte hired the guy, and uh, the guy basically forged a bunch of absentee ballots for the Republican candidate. Uh, the Republican candidate won by about 700 votes. Uh, the ballots were challenged. And there was enough evidence he would have been sloppy enough that they had to throw out the election. The guy was indicted along with his associates and they reran the election. A Republican won the uh, another Republican candidate became the Republican nominee and won that seat. But it showed, you know, they will steal a congressional race, anyone. And this happened, you know, in the Republican uh, ranks. Right. So it's a problem. And anytime you have an absentee ballot, the following things can happen that don't happen if you vote at the polls. Someone can steal it from your mailbox. Someone can intimidate you, your employer, your union, your spouse, um, you know, a local political machine. Uh, someone can go door to door and improperly help help you fill it out the ballot, which is illegal. Uh, someone can pick up your ballot as a part of a ballot harvesting effort. And let's say they pick up your ballot and in talking to you, they think that you're voting for the person they don't want. They can simply lose your ballot. They won't deliver it. Uh, or they'll uh, steam it open and uh, find out how you voted. Right. Secondly, um, nursing homes. Nursing yes. homes are filled with people. Some of them are, are, shall we say, in a slow fade from life. And they're not always, you know, completely compass metis. Think about this, Ed. Within the last couple decades, two former Democratic congressmen in Pennsylvania, these are people with reputations, they're former congressmen, <coughs> they were both indicted for going into nursing homes and helping Alzheimer patients fill out the ballot illegally. Right. Yep. Now, if two former congressmen will take that risk personally, who else is going to take that risk? Who else has done it? Yeah, so mail-in voting, in addition, has other problems. For example, 
Ed, if you wanted to uh, send something valuable, let's say for some reason you had to send something valuable, would you really trust the U.S. Postal Service's first-class mail system? No, no, no. I would, I would want at least something that has tracking. And the U.S. Postal Service actually has, uh, you know, more secure tracking systems. Uh, you know, if nothing else, certified mail. But I mean, you can do well. Oh, yeah, but yeah. but not for regular first-class mail. They not for regular first-class. No, no. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm ma- completely agreeing with you. I mean, it's not the mail-in balloting yeah. is perilous for the following reason: the Postal Service. You know, remember, fewer and fewer people are writing letters. Fewer and fewer letters are being sent. The Postal Service is slipping in the deficit, and they admit that they've moved their standards to for you know planned service deterioration. CBS News, Ed, did an experiment in the last election. This is not some right wing website. This is CBS News, and NBC News duplicated it as well. They took a po- out a post office box in Philadelphia. They had a hundred envelopes prepared that were the same size and weight as a mail in ballot, and they sent it to that post office. After a week, they went to the post office. There was nothing in the mailbox, nothing. So they went to the counter. Where's our mail? Oh, you don't must not have any. So they finally went up the chain to the supervisor of the entire post office who came out. He looks at the camera and says, well, I guess I probably should take this seriously. This is a network television. So he goes back. <laughs> they hear him. They hear him in the background behind the counter, you know, moving boxes around and stuff. And then they hear after about five minutes him shouting, Oh, that's where they were. <laughs> then, he brings out, then he brings out 47 envelopes. Well, first of all, they were glad to get the 47, but the question is what happened to the other 53? Right. This has been a week. So it took, after three weeks, they went back. By that point, 97 envelopes had come in. But there are two questions. What if, what if someone had sent in their ballot eight or nine days before the election? It, it still wouldn't have arrived in time. Secondly, um, the 97 ballots. Ed, you know, lots of elections are decided by less than 3% of the vote. Yeah, especially, especially, Ted you Cruz, know, yeah. Ted Cruz's election in Texas was decided by less than 3% last time. So if 3% of the ballots could be missing, that could swing the entire election. You'd never know who won. That's exactly right. I mean, this is, and this is part of the reason why you, you should make changes that build security into systems, not take security out of systems. And I couldn't agree with you more. You know, after the 2000 election, the Bush v. Gore fiasco in Florida, we actually had a bipartisan bill pass Congress. It passed a Democratic Senate and was signed into law by a Republican president. And the, the sponsor, Chris Dodd, who's one of Joe Biden's close friends, said the purpose of this law is to make it easy to vote and hard to cheat. We're going to do both because we can do both at the same time in America. Well, unfortunately, the issue has become completely polarized. There's no prospect of having a bipartisan bill. S1 and and HR1, those two bills in the Congress that Chuck Schumer is going to try to force through next week in the Senate, uh, they are completely partisan, Yep, a complete federal takeover of all state election laws. And they don't. They didn't even make an attempt to modify them to even get one Republican supporter. There is not one Republican supporter of those bills. They don't have fifty Democrats either. I mean, Joe Manchin says he won't do it without Republican buy-in. There's a, at least a, and a few Sinema, others. Same, yeah. And Kristen Sinema said she won't break the filibuster in order to get that passed. So the point is, the Democrats are just going pell-mell to cement uh, a deterioration of our election integrity laws that already went into motion in 2020. And a lot of the book, Ed, is about the changes that COVID enabled with the election laws that fundamentally changed the way we vote. The the, the left immediately saw COVID as an opportunity. They immediately said, well, people will not be able to turn up in person and vote. We have to go to all mail elections as much as possible. And we have to have emergency decrees that state legislatures don't even vote on. And many of these were issued by health bureaucrats, not even right. not elected officials. Well, it turned out that the same month that COVID hit, South Korea had 27 million people vote in an election, orderly, no major infections. Wisconsin had a primary election. I think only 15 people in the whole state contracted COVID. <laughs> so it wasn't necessary. But the left is now trying to keep all of those provisions and the sloppy verification of signatures that resulted from that tsunami of mail-in ballots. They're trying to keep all of that in place so that mail-in balloting not only becomes the norm, but becomes a very sloppy norm in which, as we discussed earlier, you can have a lot of um, 
play in the joints at least and a lot of uh you know cut shortcuts to getting you know ballots that are not valid into the system right well you can read more in the book, Our Broken Elections, How the Left Changed the Way You Vote. I'm not going to have John give you any more of the solutions because you got to read the book. you got to go buy the book. It's available right now on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Uh, you can get it hard copy. You can get it on Kindle. Um, uh, you know, we want to make sure that people uh, we, we get people out there to, to And take it's a also on Audible. It's, uh, who, who does the... Um, who does the performance on Audible? Unfortunately, it's neither Hans nor me that 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 they've turned it over to professionals. But it's still a good listen. <laughs> uh, the other thing I would simply say: you've got a this. voice for this. Wait a minute, wait, wait! I got to stop right there. You've got a great voice for this. I'm surprised that they. I'm surprised they didn't have you do it. Um, you know, the next time next time I'm hold I'll hold out as part of the contract. <laughs> but Ed, the one thing I wanted to say is, uh, you know, even if you don't buy the book. Um, if you talk to someone and they claim there is no voter fraud, go to the Heritage Foundation's website, just type in, you know, voter fraud, and there'll be a database that comes up that'll list 1,500 individuals or groups of individuals that have been indicted and convicted of voter fraud in all 50 states in the last few years. And for anyone to say that voter fraud is not a problem in this country, uh, the answer is most of the time it isn't because most elections aren't close and there's not a great incentive to do it. But if people see an election in advance being close and they can plan for that and they realize that a few votes can make a difference, you know, human nature is human nature and they yep. will sometimes fall prey to temptation. And we want, you know, we want the, the old Ronald Reagan phrase, we trust but verify. And yep. that's what our election should be all about. That's exactly correct. John Fund co-author of Our Broken Elections, How the Left Changed the Way You Vote. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Ed.